présent, j'ai le plaisir d'accueillir Bradley Kuhn avec vous, euh, qui est impliqué dans la Free Software euh, NGO depuis 1999. Euh, le Software Freedom Conservancy est, est une association à but non lucratif euh, qui héberge des projets de logiciels libres euh, pour leur permettre en fait, de, 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 non seulement de se financer, mais d'obtenir des supports au-delà de, des supports simplement du code d'obtenir des supports sur tout ce qui va à côté dans le développement d'un projet. Donc il nous présente aujourd'hui ce modèle atypique avec deux idées clés qu'il souhaite partager avec nous. La première, c'est que les, idées, les organisations non gouvernementales et les associations, les non-profit, sont propices au développement de nouveaux logiciels libres. Et la seconde, c'est que les associations permettent aux communautés de, du logiciel libre, de fleurir sans avoir à subir les mêmes pressions ou contraintes euh, des impératifs économiques. Donc je vous demande de l'accueillir en l'applaudissant. Merci. First of all, I'd like to apologize for speaking in English. Uh, as you know, in the United States, uh, there's this belief that you're not supposed to learn any other languages. Notwithstanding that, I took both Spanish and I insisted on taking a, even a, another language when I was in school, which they didn't want me to do, but it was German. So I, I don't know why I didn't take French, but I should have, and I apologize for that. I, I want to first talk about what my background is, because I think it relates to the topic that I really want to speak to you about today. I'm the president and executive director of a nonprofit organization in the United States, called the Software Freedom Conservancy. It's what's called in the US a 501c3 organization, which is the legal uh, designation of the organization in the United States. It's akin to a 1901 association that you have here in France, uh, but I was talking to some folks who run one this morning, and I think the key difference, which I think is very important, it's something very valuable in the US system, is that a 501c3 nonprofit is legally required to advance the public good. It's legally required to act in the interest of everyone. And if I fail to do that as an executive of such an organization, I actually um, get in trouble with the Internal Revenue Service in the United States. I also used to work for another nonprofit organization in the US that you're probably much more familiar with, the Free Software Foundation. And I'm still on its board of directors. And since you're probably more familiar with that organization, I'm going to start my story with some details about that organization. It started in 1985, and it was based on, in some sense, an essay that Richard Stallman wrote in 1984 called the GNU Manifesto. This document had an incredibly profound impact on me, and it's basically decided the course of the rest of my life. And I read the document so many times, uh, I actually accidentally displayed it in Emacs. If you hit the wrong key sequence in GNU Emacs, you get a copy of the GNU Manifesto, which I think is by design. And there's two things that really struck me in that document, and they're rarely quoted anymore today, so I put them on a slide so that people are aware that this was thought of long ago. Because many people were complaining when free software began that there was no way to make money doing free software. As you see, the corporations that are so interested in using free software, we just heard from Google, whose entire infrastructure is built on free software, that it's sort of silly to think today that you can't make money doing free software. But in 1984, most people believed that you couldn't. So in his essay, uh, Richard Stallman proposed various methods you might use to fund free software. The first one he proposes is this idea that there will be a tax on all hardware that you purchase, and that tax would go into a general pool and that would fund software development. People would apply uh, for government grants, basically, to write new software. Now this, uh, you've probably followed enough of the political situation in the United States to, to understand that, that my compatriots don't really understand that it's very good, uh, like you have in France, where the state helps people. I actually believe that the French system is very good and that the state actually helps people, and I think it should. In the United States, it's hard to convince people of that. So the idea of anything uh, doing with taxes is not very popular. So the second one is much more popular, or, or at least more palatable, in the United States. And I think it should be used more often. 
this idea that people should just write free software because it's a good thing to do and because it makes a better world, and they should ask for donations and ask people who like the software to support it through donations. And when the FSF is founded and gets this status, uh, legal status that I was talking about, its primary purpose as an organization when it begins is to develop free software. It's a very long part of FSF's history. You probably know it today primarily as a licensing and an advocacy organization. But initially, it was designed to develop free software because it was the only place that was doing it. And I did some research and found this very large list of people who were paid by the FSF to write some of the initial free software programs that are central to the free software infrastructure today, including funding the Debian distribution. The first GNU Linux distribution was, in fact, funded by the FSF initially. Debian eventually went independent from the FSF after about a year or two. But initially, it was funded by the FSF to advance free software for the public good. These days, from the point of view of most nonprofit organizations, like the one I work for, free software is written by volunteers. Now, they're only volunteers from our point of view in the nonprofits. In fact, they're usually being paid. For-profit companies are usually paying them to develop this free software. And we know many of them. Red Hat was probably one of the first, particularly through the Cygnus uh, company that it acquired in the late 90s, which uh, predates Red Hat by many years. And Google does this, and IBM does this, and HP does this. Many companies contribute to free software by allowing their employees to contribute. However, they're not just doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. For-profit companies are required to advance the interests of their shareholders, to make money for their shareholders. By contrast, nonprofit organizations, particularly ones in, uh, there are 501c3s in the U.S., are required by law to act in the public good. And I fundamentally believe, it's not that I'm against for-profit companies, but I believe that software freedom works best when public good, making the world a better place, is its focus. And thus, I think the best place to do free software development is nonprofit organizations. And for-profits can fund this development through nonprofits, but the nonprofit, since its legal requirement is to act in the public good, it provides a certain protection for the free software world to ensure that it's advancing what matters for the general public who wants to use the software. While this contribution from these volunteers really does help free software, and we can't get rid of it. I'm not proposing that we stop volunteers from contributing. In fact, without these volunteers who are being paid by their companies and this idea of the 20% time that HP and Google were some of the first to initiate, that's been a huge help to making free software better, that employees have a certain amount of time in their schedule each week to give to free software projects. But what actually happens is the code bases of these free software programs tend to drift in the direction that are in the interest of the shareholders of the companies. So I believe as a counterbalance to that, we need also free software developers to be funded by nonprofits so that those free software developers only need to act in the interest of the public good to make the world a better place. When I hire a contractor at Conservancy to work on free software, the only mandate I give them is you must do what's best for the project. You must make the project better for the, good, for the public. And that's, that's what you have to do. And as long as I'm sure you're doing that, you're doing your job. That helps mitigate some of the push from for-profit companies that want these code bases to move in directions that they care about. And nonprofits are basically structured very well to do this. You've heard today about humanitarian nonprofits that are doing this work for humanitarian software, but this can be done for all sorts of general infrastructure software too, through nonprofits. In the United States, and I believe in, in France as well, there's a status uh, of the 1901 associations you can get where donations are tax deductible and both companies and individuals can give to nonprofits and receive credit on their taxes for that. And the nonprofits distribute those funds to advance and improve the public good. This is a really good way to make sure that the for-profit interests don't control the companies because the public can fund the free software development that it wants. And not only that, but developers who are primarily focused on software development 
can use the nonprofit as a governance structure to make sure that they have a governance for their project that's able to outlast them as individuals and also not allow the for-profit influence to become too strong. Conservancy has done a little bit of this work already. One of the examples we have is in the late 2000s, the Twisted Project, which is a very widely used Python library for network programming, basically needed core attention. This is a classic problem with free software projects, particularly libraries that become popular. Many, many companies have a strong interest in using the library and building stuff around it. And in fact, the first people that those companies will hire will be people like Jean-Paul Caudron of the Twisted Project who know the library best and therefore are the best people to hire to build applications. But when they're busy building applications that use the library, they don't have the time available to maintain the core, to maintain the library. And in fact, the Twisted community was very aware of this and came to Conservancy to ask us for help to figure out how to raise money so that John Paul could give his attention to the development of the core and, and fixing bugs in the core of Twisted rather than working on applications. And we were able to find many companies who relied on Twisted, many individuals who were excited about the project to donate. And we were able to fund John Paul part-time for about two and a half years to do this. And we're currently fundraising again for that. So if you care about Twisted, uh, come and see me and, and make a donation so that we can again get Twist, uh, John Paul doing this work. Another wonderful example of this is Matt McCall, who came to me and said that he was sick of the fact that he couldn't focus on Mercurial development because he was funding it in his part-time by doing Linux kernel module development in his day job. And he said the context switch was very difficult to go from kernel space to Python user space. So we helped Matt raise funds so that his work on Mercurial could be funded and drafted up a detailed proposal for the community. We want to fund the key uh, fellowship for the key maintainer of Mercurial so he can focus all the time being on IRC, accepting merge requests, doing code review, looking at people's patches, giving feedback on patches, and adding new features himself to Mercurial. He was funded for basic, almost two and a half years. Uh, we, we've run out of funding for him right now. We're, we're fundraising for it again. But the, again, this is a case where companies that cared about Mercurial were willing to give because they want Matt to be an independent person to make sure that Mercurial is the best possible version control system it can be. Probably our, one of our greatest successes is, is with PyPy. Uh, I've been amazed that so many people want to donate to PyPy that they have three parallel initiatives for fundraising going on, both of which are all doing very well. They're working on raising funds, and we're already funding some developers to make Python 3 support work in PyPy. And we're adding NumPy support, a completely separate project to PyPy. Each of those projects individually have already raised $42,000, which we're using to pay developers. And in the middle of that, they launched yet another fundraising campaign, to do transactional memory in, in, in software for PyPy. And that itself has just raised $23,000. And, and people are continuing to give. And we now have on contract with Conservancy for developers, again, whose job is to make PyPy the best Python implementation it can be. They have no other requirement than that. There's no shareholders they have to worry about delivering value to. All I want to see every month when they send me an invoice is a list of commits that are good, that went into the main code base, and a blog post that says, hey, here's some great work that we're doing in PyPy. I believe this kind of development is a very important part of the free software community. I hope that you'll donate to the nonprofits that do this. Conservancy and FSF are not the only ones. There's many of them out there that fund free software development. And we should think about that. As a user of free software, it's important that you have people whose goal is to just work on free software to make it better for you. And I hope you'll support organizations that do that. Here's some information about where you can find more information about me and the Conservancy. I have a podcast, if you want to listen to it, it's in English, obviously, about uh, free software legal and licensing issues. I'm speaking later today down on the licensing track uh, in, uh, in the negative two, if you want to hear more about that type of work. And I thank you all for listening. I realize I'm standing between you and lunch, so I will end a minute early and let you all enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.